um, council finance uh, meeting to order, and I'd ask the clerk to uh, call the roll. Councilmember Evans. Present. Councilmember Harris. Councilmember Patterson. Vice President Lightfoot. Present, ma'am. President Scott. Just a quick note, Councilmember Patterson is on the line. Yep, Councilmember Patterson. Yeah, Councilmember Patterson is present and in the building virtually. Um, thank you all for um, coming. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get right into it with uh, a presentation for the district. But just to recap a little bit, the reason why we're all here is um, one of the things I know um, council has talked about, as well as I know uh, my colleagues at the school district, is that in advance of the budget hearing that is taking place on June 10th, we wanted to make sure that we continue to have um, good dialogue because that budget deliberation session that we have on June 10th is only an hour, hour and a half. So, so what we've been doing is wanting to make sure that we have more time to talk about the district budget um, and any other uh, issues of mutual concern that we might have during this process leading up to that. We do have um, a question log. Um, I wanna thank the district for answering just about every single question that's on that log. And any questions that we can't get answered today, obviously we'll continue that log leading up to um, the budget and then even after that. So the idea is to really um, increase um, and improve communication between us as bodies. So that way that helps us with a, a smooth budget um, process. The, um, just for a couple of housekeeping things for my colleagues on the finance committee, um, May 15th is the date that the city's budget will be released. The mayor will be releasing the city's budget on May 15th. Um, and then on June 3rd and June 9th, we will have all of our hearings with um, the various city departments. And then on June 10th is the um, final budget hearing for the Rochester City School District budget. Um, with that being said, I'm sure that you guys may have saw, um, I, I, was re I, I couldn't sleep last night, so I read um, the comptroller's um, report on sales tax, re sales tax revenue. And I'm sure you saw Monroe County sales tax revenue was down by 25%. The city's was down by 24%. Um, and you know, so it, it means that as a, as, as a city, as a school district, it's, I think it's important for us to contemplate the what ifs. If anybody has ever seen um, Pulp Fiction, there's a line where he says, I'm trying to contemplate the what ifs. And um, I'm hoping that the what ifs won't be um, cuts to both the city and the, the, the school district's budget from the state. But um, we, we have to think about that between now and whenever we pass our both, both of our budgets. So I know that this, the, the school district has started to think about that. I know the city is thinking about that. but I'm hoping that the federal government will, will step in and really help states and municipalities. Otherwise, it's gonna be painful for all of us all around. So with that, um, I, I wanna allow the, um, the, uh, C the uh, CFO and the deputy superintendent um, to give us um, the presentation. I would ask that we allow them to get through the entirety of the presentation before we start the dialogue but I wanna turn it over to uh, Mr. Franklin and uh, uh, Ms. Quick. And again, thank you all for um, coming. Thank you and thank you all for being on uh, the call with us today. The presentation that we're going to go through uh, for you is actually a continuation of the last time we were together. I believe it was on the 24th of April. So um, we will briefly cover some of the highlights of what we gave to you that day, but. Since April 24th, we have made some amendments to our budget uh, prior to its adoption last Thursday, and we would like to cover those so you have an idea of, of what we did amend and change in our budget since our last presentation. So I'll try and walk you through some of the high levels uh, of again. So as you know, um, we really were looking at $152 million deficit from 1920. Uh, school year, we had a $30 million reduction um, in efficiencies, which included 151 mid-year staff reductions that helped us close our 1920 gap. And then we also received $35 million from the state that helped us to avoid additional staff cuts and reductions. But for 2021, despite all of those efforts, we still remained um, at a deficit, which we thought when we started was $60 million, um, but grew by $27 million more once we had our revised eight 
figures from the state in large part due to COVID. So we approached um, our budget process um, in stages, but ultimately had to find $87 million to cut in the 2021 budget. Our decision-making factors, I think we did talk about this uh, at the last meeting. Uh, several different factors went into this budget and the revisions that I'll share with you. The board budget priorities that were shared with us, uh, including reduction in senior leadership team, central office reorganization and reduction, I want to particularly highlight the right sizing of our school staffing due to the decline in student enrollment. And I'll cover with you what some of those staffing models look like. Building level staff, maximizing our school staffing ratios according to our collective bargaining agreements and maximizing the class sizes uh, to achieve efficiencies. We used a formula-based approach to do so, uh, so that it was fair and objective. And I'm also going to talk a little bit uh, just to remind you about some of the program school transitions that were part of this budget that was adopted. <clears throat> this screen is actually updated from the last one that you saw in the last presentation and reflects the total amounts of reductions in staff according to the various bargaining units and unit groups we have. And so you'll see that um, we, as a total, reduced 395.09 staff. And I believe and you are in the block, the last block, but I believe it's a six point, I'm <laughs> sorry, I have to reduce you to actually get it out of there and I can't. Um, it's over a 6% reduction in the total percentage of staff uh, for the 2021 school year, but you can see the breakdown according to our groups. ASAR is our administrative unit, um, which obviously had um, a very high reduction as well as our SEG group, which is the superintendent's employment group, uh, which is part of central office. Again, total 395 staff. The school closures and transitions we did share last time, but we did want to reiterate to you that they remain in our revised budget that was approved. School number 44 is closing. That is saving $3.1 million in our budget process. School number 57 is closing. I will talk about that uh, a little bit more. That saved 2.2 million. School number 20 is closing. That's a $3.5 million savings. And school number 44, or excuse me, 43 is also closing, and that is saving 4.3 million. Uh, we are redesigning school number three and converting it to a middle school, and the savings in, in doing so will be $1.7 million for 2021. In addition to school closures, we are making program closures and transitions as part of this budget process. So the bilingual language and literacy academy closure is projected to save 2.7 million. Young Mothers and Interim Health Academy is closing and those, those students will be transitioned into other schools and programs. By doing so, we will save 2.2 million. New Beginnings Program is gonna be moved to the fourth floor at Hart Street. We'll share staff with the Lynx Program. That generates a lot of efficiencies by having those two programs in the same building. Uh, so we will have savings there. And transition of the RIA Program, which I'm sure that you've heard about to a 712 program model as per um, state ed's recommendations and requirements, I would add, is saving us $3.1 million. So now I'm transport, uh, transmitting into the next phase, which in order to um, adjust our budget um, and to get it passed last week, we did make some um, rather significant adjustments. We um, added some staff back and we took some other things away. Uh, including staff, but also made some additional shifts to be able to accommodate um, some board priorities and additions back into the budget. So in doing so, we, um, we did look at um, a number of different things and including the shuttering of three buildings, 20, 25, and 43, and really um, dug into what that meant for us as far as actual savings. So you will see uh, maintenance and utility savings by closing buildings is totaling $350,000. And because we will not be utilizing 57 for a pre-K program, which I'll talk about in a middle, minute, is actually saving us $150,000. The bus routing consolidation um, is an element we um, also adjusted. We adjusted our bell schedules such that we are on two consistent bell schedules and it allowed us to adjust our transportation, our bus routes. So in doing so, we were able to generate an estimated $900,000 in savings. So all of these projected operational savings total 1.4 million. It is allowing us to make some of the other shifts that you will see in future slides. 
As part of the final budget that was approved last week, we did make adjustments to our pre-K centers. The initial draft budget that was presented to the board and it, by resolution was adopted by the board in February included two new pre-K centers to be housed at schools 44 and 57. In the budget that was approved, we will be opening only one new pre-K center and that will be located at school 44. School 57 will not be hosting a pre-K center for 2021, but we will be using that building to house our special education staff and to hold CSE students with parents. By doing so, we are uh, returning 215 seats back to our CBOs. And I want to reiterate that in opening one center, we are continuing ahead with enrichment services to all students who are interested in that service um, as previously planned. I also want to address counselors and social workers, and that was a concern. I believe it was a concern raised by council members, but it was also a concern raised by board members and the community. So I want to cover a little bit about um, our staffing ratios with counselors and social workers and some of the shifts that we made in particular with social workers. For 2021, we have 77.4 counselors that we will have on staff. 5.5 of them are assigned to our K-6 elementary buildings. They rotate through those buildings and are shared amongst the elementary buildings. There is one counselor that is assigned to our placement office, and the additional 70.9 counselors are assigned to our 712 buildings and programs. In reaching an appropriate staffing level for counselors, we uh, turn to the ASCA and use their recommended ratio in developing our staffing model. And that staffing ratio that they recommend is a 250 to one staffing ratio. The actual staffing ratio that you um, will see for our buildings for 2021 based upon the 77.4 counselors is actually 155 to one. For social workers, we also used um, a recommended ratio and that is um, according to the National Association of Social Workers, which recommends an actual uh, a recommended ratio of 50 to one for students who need intensive support services. If you look at the number of students that we have with intensive support services required on their IEPs, our actual ratio based upon 93.5 social workers for 2021 is a 26 to one ratio. So we do believe that we're staffed according to the needs that we have and we have extra social workers available to do non-mandated services and supplemental services. I want to point out that in addition to the, I'm going to go back to this there, thank you. We have 93.5 social workers supporting mandated services, but we do have additional social emotional supports built into our budget, um, into our staffing for 2021 to support our students. We have nine social workers budgeted for in our special education department. Those are centralized social workers. We have five social workers that are centralized in our student support services department. In reaching this budget, uh, we did take some money uh, that was grant funded money that was going to support our instructional coaches. We were originally going to hire 14 instructional coaches to, to support our new reading program, as well as the next generation learning standards rollout that we are involved in right now uh, for next year and the following year. We've taken seven of those instructional coaches away and allocated that grant funding to hire 7.5 or return 7.5 social workers for 2021. They cannot do mandated services, but they can do supplemental support services, such as crisis intervention, uh, suicide prevention, counseling with families and students um, outside of IEP services. In addition, we have 49 FTEs and health zone counselors and crisis intervention prevention specialists that are being provided for a contract with the Center for Youth. And we also have six social workers allocated through Catholic Family Services. I would point out that the 49 social workers for Center for Youth and the six through Catholic Family Services are not for mandated uh, services either. They're not for IEP services, but they are available to do supplemental support services for our students and families. So uh, just to kind of go over social workers uh, originally, we were going to um, have a reduction of 32.5 social workers. That was our initial budget proposal, which would have saved $2.6 million. Um, 8.5 of the 32 and a half social workers are actually social workers assigned to buildings and programs that are closing for 2020. 
21. So if you take the 8.5 off of the 32, uh, we're not at 32 and a half so social worker reductions, we're actually at 24 social worker reductions. As part of our restorations, we are restoring 12 social workers. So that brings that 12, 24 social worker reduction down to 12. 7.5 of them are offsetting um, the, uh, from the grant funds. They're not for mandated services. And 4.5 social workers are actually general fund uh, social workers and will be doing mandated services. So the actual overall reduction is not 32 and a half. It's not 24. It's actually 12 at the end of the day from our um, budget for this year. Also, as part of the social workers, um, we were asked by the board as a priority to restore the Chief of Student Support Services uh, to the SEG, uh, the cabinet position at central office, and that was also done as part of our final budget. I believe in the last conversation, as well as in some of the question logs, there were questions about special education. Uh, so we would like to double back on special education uh, just to cover a couple of highlights and to stress to you that as part of this budget for 2021, we are meeting all mandated services for our students. But we have made some changes in our special education programming in response to some concerns that were raised since the initial program uh, budget was um, proposed. The original budget that was proposed for special education um, included a reduction of $10.4 million. We have restored several positions back into special education, including um, five associate directors, two social workers, and one behavior specialist. You will not see this next bullet in the final budget book because it literally happened last week after we went to print, but there's actually an additional five associate director positions that have been added back in as well, which brings our total number of associate directors reduced by to one total for the school year. And by, it, by doing that, the five associate director positions, we are again assuring all mandated services can be met, all CSE meetings can be held, and all of the requirements um, placed upon us to service our special education needs and our families will be covered. To restore the last five associate director positions, we did have to make an adjustment, and you will see it in the budget book. We did remove eight TCOSA positions. Those are actually teacher positions and replace them with five associate directors. That's how we were able to be budget neutral in that last shift. The last budget, uh, excuse me, the last bullet you see is with regard to the restoration of the Chief of Specialized Services to the SEG group. Uh, much like um, the last Chief that was restored in the previous page, we did hear this as a priority from the board um, and the necessity for this position. So as part of our final budget, there is a restoration of the Chief of Specialized Services. So additional budget changes that we just want to highlight. We had heard in budget priority, you saw it on our uh, previous page, as far as the considerations that we took into account in making this budget proposal. Central office reductions totaled 3.3 million in our final adopted budget. There was much conversation around the East EPO arrangement. Uh, we do have as part of the final budget, a reduction at the East EPO of $4.5 million. As part of our final budget, we also restored the Director of African American Studies. That position was cut in the original budget proposal. The J. Rotsi instructional positions have been restored. They um, were in the original budget reflected as cuts. We have restored those positions and the funding um, was available to go along with them. We also added back into the budget a Director of Multilingual Learners. Originally, we we're going to add that as a director of ESSEL because that was an existing job description that we already had approved, but the job description has been rewritten. It is basically the same job description, but it's now called director of multilingual learners. That is in the budget um, as finally adopted. We also restored a director of arts position. Uh, we originally had created a director of humanities that would have covered both humanities through the social studies and the arts program. We have separated that back out, so we will have a director of social studies uh, still in the budget, but also added the director of arts position back. Um, another thing that we looked at in trying to reach this balanced budget was every revenue source uh, that we could, and we went back to our charter school tuition rate adjustment. And in the final New York State enacted budget, um, if you ran our numbers for charter school enrollments for 2021, 
and uh, looked at the charter school tuition rate, we have a $5.5 million reduction that we were able to capture into this final budget proposal, uh, which is part of how we were able to um, get to $87 million, in particular, that last $27 million reduction that we had to make when we realized what our anticipated revenue was going to be. And I think we also talked about this last time, but uh, in our final budget, there is the $5 million reduction in the cash, cash capital um, amendment. So we now are swiping all of that money, uh, the total of $10 million to support our general fund at expenditures. As part of this conversation, um, Emily, you and I had this conversation on Monday, concerns about um, addressing the controller's audit, the first phase of the audit that has been issued. Um, you really wanted to hear from us on how we were addressing what the controller's findings were from that audit. And so I'm going to let Mr. Franklin talk about that a little bit. Thank you, certainly. Uh, the first um, observation that the committee wanted to discuss was our current practice of having a negative appropriation representing savings from a vacancy turnover and staff turnover uh, rates. Um, historically, the school district has, um, for quite a while, at least several decades, reflected as a negative appropriation the offsetting savings that we generate from having position vacancies and natural staff turnover. For the uh, upcoming fiscal year 21 budget, our vacancy turnover amount has been reduced from what you may have seen in the current year, 28 million, uh, down to 14 million. Uh, this is a roughly 3% of, uh, well, the slide says 3% of all positions, it's really more reflective of the dollar value of those positions at any given time uh, being vacant. Uh, this is a much more reasonable estimate uh, based on the observed trends we see from prior fiscal years. Um, I, I do want to say that there is a significant amount of math behind this particular uh, offsetting savings. Um, the state comptroller is reviewing this and we discussed this with them today and gave them all the supporting documentation for their review. I know uh, several of the council members questioned this, um, noting the comptroller's report that this is uh, unique, uh, a unique way of reflecting the district savings from position vacancies. Uh, we recognize that and we are open to reevaluating our approach to reflecting the value of um, the dollar savings from position vacancies. Um, I, I'm sure several of the council members would have liked us to evaluate that for this budget, but the reality we faced is just it was too tight a turnaround to make that significant change within the systems we have available to us. Uh, but we will certainly evaluate that um, as a change for the, the fiscal year 22 budget. Another observation that several of the council members wanted to discuss, um, Comptroller noted six major areas that the district did not appropriately budget our expenditures. Um, and these six areas were an issue for the district, both in fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2020. Um, I would like to put my cards on the table and put right out there that this administration is committed to honest budgeting. Those areas identified by the state comptroller um, in prior years had math behind them, but in the face of limited funding and uh, priorities of not only the board, but operating department managers and program managers, um, there had been some arbitrary reductions to those appropriation estimates. Um, the current budget director and I were both recently appointed within the current fiscal year. Um, we're very methodical in our approach to budgeting. We do base our expenditure estimates on observed trends, observed rates of growth, uh, the changes that we know are coming down the road, and 
certainly some assumptions of economic conditions. Um, no assumptions can be perfect, but again, we are working with the state comptroller's office uh, so that they at least have a level of comfort that our assumptions are reasonable. And I believe that's enough said on that. Um, Deputy Superintendent. Thank you, Bob. And I do want to just uh, follow up on what Bob said. We are um, very much like the city working on a plan, a contingency plan or a plan B, should there be um, mid-year clawbacks. We did see the state's financial plan. We are very well aware of the numbers that were in there and the $8 billion to uh, local municipalities that was identified as a shortfall and the potential for that clawback um, is something that we are very concerned about as well. And so we have been working uh, very diligently on plans. Uh, we will continue to meet this week and next week to try and um, really put more um, meat behind them, the numbers behind them. We also are hoping that there's federal money to help support New York State and our efforts uh, so that those mid-year cuts don't happen or are not that deep. So we do share in that and, and we'll be working very diligently on things. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, before I go to questions, um, I just have a few and then I'll turn it over to um, my colleagues who I know who, have, who also have questions. Um, in terms of the school closures, 44, 57, 20, and 43, are, are, are those schools completely closed? Would they be used for other district purposes, swing space, et cetera, or are they going to completely close and be turned over to the city? Uh, I don't have the presentation in front of me, but um, 44 and 57 are both being used. Um, for pre-K and then for offices, for special education, as well as CSE meetings. Um, but I believe that the other buildings, um, 1920 and 43, I believe are being closed. I believe that is correct. Emory, all three are, there they are. Um, not 19, Linda. Not 19, 20 and 43 um, are being closed, 44 and 57 are being reallocated for pre-K as well as the special education. And three obviously is being redesigned for middle school. So two so, are being closed. Okay, so the, so the savings on uh, 44 and 57, mm -hmm. what, what accounts for that, for that savings um, being that those buildings are still gonna be, that you're still gonna be using those buildings? Is, is it less programming? How, how, did, how did you arrive at that, at that number? It will not be house, host, host, hosting elementary programming. So they will not have the full cadre of um, elementary school programming there. They will operate as pre-K centers. And so they will be covered under the pre-K grant. All the operational expenses will be covered by the pre-K grant. The staff will be covered by the pre-K grant. We will have um, a K-1 continuum classroom in each of those buildings. Um, but other than that, they are not operating as full elementary buildings. And so that is where the savings are. Um, the elementary staff that we've had in those buildings will no longer be necessary. Those students will be moved. Um, it'll be pre-K centers. Okay. And then um, the, the, uh, another two quick questions. Um, the, the fund balance area, how, could you just touch on that? Um, how, how are you guys doing with the, 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 the fund balance? So uh, thank you. Um, yes, I believe everybody knows as of the end of the last fiscal year, we had an unrestricted deficit of $8.9 million. Um, that is being recovered in the current year as part of um, the $35 million in spin-up aid we received from New York State. In addition uh, to eliminating that deficit, we are evaluating the savings the districts will um, benefit from our COVID-19 school closures. Uh, there are certainly savings from utilities and maintenance costs at our schools and buildings, uh, savings from substitute teachers, our contracted transportation, um, and items such as that. And we are evaluating um, what dollars will um, fall to our fund balance at the close of this fiscal year. Some of those dollars will have to be assigned. Uh, for example, we'll have a little bit of savings in health insurance due to the fact that Elective procedures have been put on hold for quite some time, but we know those are gonna come back around to us perhaps later this summer and fall. So we'll be um, processing uh, either an encumbrance reserve or other mechanisms to assign 
fund balance for the eventual um, medical costs that we will be seeing. Um, we also have, I believe you already know this and it was touched upon in the presentation, the fiscal year 21 budget includes an $8 million appropriation for, we call it appropriation for deficit reduction. Uh, really it's an appropriation to rebuild our fund balance. By board policy, when our fund balance falls below a certain threshold, we are expected to recover that fund balance in amount roughly equal to 1% of our general fund operating expenditures each year. For us, mathematically, it's about $8 million. Okay, thanks. Um, and, and then my last question before I go to my colleagues. Um, so yesterday we had a council meeting. We were surprised. We, and today we've been getting a lot of emails, calls, and voice messages regarding school resource officers. Um, can you can, can you update us on that? Do you know why we are getting um, inundated with with and, and basically it's 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 uh, all of them have been calls of support um, asking the city city council um, to to not support cutting school resource officers. But that but but the request for school resource officers comes from the district. So can you just clarify? Um, what's going on there? Because this, 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 these are all between yesterday and today that we've gotten dozens of calls and uh, comments sent in that we've read during our Speak to Council yesterday regarding SRO. So our final budget, um, this year we have 12 SROs assigned and a cadre of SSOs. Uh, for next year, uh, we have reduced the number of SROs to five and you will see five in the budget documents that you receive. Um, and you will see it an according shift to SSO staff, which are district level security officer staff. Um, but there are five SROs that are in our budget for next year. Okay, so that explains the, the calls we were getting. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Council Member Patterson and then Lightfoot, you told me, you just messaged me that you both had questions. So Council Member Patterson and then Lightfoot. All right, good afternoon all. I hope everyone is well. Um, so a general question at first, um, I was taking a look at your certified resolution from last year um, regarding your budget estimates for 1920, and your grand total budget was $931,299,075. Um, when we look at your budget estimates for the 2021 fiscal year, we're looking at $927,587,000. A difference of three million seven hundred eleven and two hundred and fifty one dollars three million seven hundred eleven thousand two hundred fifty one dollars um, that's the Delta between your two budget years and yet when we go through the document that you presented us today we are looking at forty three point three million dollars in reductions in concessions and I'm just wondering if you could talk briefly in general about that delta. I mean, I, you, you, on one document, I'm seeing these huge cuts, but when I compare your budget from last year to this year, not so much. So can you talk about that a little bit? Did I just lose Bob? Uh, is Bob there? There he is. <laughs> Hello, sorry about that. I didn't realize I was back on mute. Uh, yes, I can uh, address some of that. Some of our deficit reduction strategies um, don't really reflect in the budget book itself because when you reference 927 million versus 931 million, um, what you are referring to is all funds. So as the school district needed to close a certain dollar amount of a budget gap, we always tend to focus on the budget gap within our general fund. Um, so part of our gap closing measures was the district's ability to work with state education department and shift a variety of general fund expenses, both in the current year and in the upcoming budget year, out of our general fund and into title funding. Those could be a variety of contracted services and a variety of staffing positions. Um, so that shift from general fund to title funding counts for us as a gap closing measure, um, but that's certainly why you don't see a corresponding dollar reduction 
as presented in an all funds schedule. Okay, I, I hear what you're saying. I guess my, my, I guess I don't really understand what you're saying because the dollars, so the dollars come in and then the dollars go out. Um, however, or wherever the dollars come in is where they come in. And I'm, you're, so your resolution, your 2020 resolution shows the dollars that you, co you have coming in. Um, and I certainly don't doubt that. Um, mm -hmm. I was really asking about the resolution, about, uh, about uh, your revenue. Um, I, I take it for granted that your, your, uh, your appropriations at the end balance out. So that, so that's not a problem, but I mean, the challenge is your revenue hasn't changed and significantly and neither has your, neither have your expenditures from what we're seeing change significantly. And, you know, but at the same time, we're looking at from the document that you presented to us today, a $43 million change. And, I guess I'm trying to, you know, just help me understand. A lot of those are reflective of opportunity costs. Um, the budgetary reductions needed to close our tax supported funding. And by tax supported funding, I mean our um, revenues from the city of Rochester and from New York state in the form of state aid. Um, those are in the general fund and we achieve budgetary savings when we can take expenses out of the general fund and have them grant supported. Um, it is not generally reflective in a all funds presentation, which you described the 931 million versus 927. Uh, but when we don't have to use tax supported dollars to fund those expenses, um, that that is an ability to close a budgetary gap. And we always refer to a budgetary gap as a tax supported gap. Okay, I, I, I hear you, but even when I'm looking at your grants and special aid, I'm looking at your, your grants and special aid fund revenues, those didn't change, those didn't change significantly. But, so let me move on to my other question. Okay. Um, so, so that's the first one. The next question we have here is, uh, I direct everyone to page five of your document. So um, I, so you are in fact planning on returning schools 20 and 43 to the city of Rochester. Is that correct? Yes. Actually, okay. if, if I could, if I could just jump in, I'm so sorry. Um, actually um, school 20 we are going to be using um, and this was a decision that we just made um, you know recently um, we are expanding our North Star program which is currently held at um, Hart Street what we're doing is we're bringing back um, between 50 and 60 students of ours that are currently being serviced at BOCES so we are returning them and so we will move the entire program that will be approximately 150 students we will be moving them to school 20 um, that allowed us to um, get out of one of our leases at Hart Street to, for additional savings. So um, that was a decision that came late. So um, I'm very sorry that um, Deputy Superintendent Quick wasn't up um, on all the details of that. But um, School 43, we will not be using for any, any programs. So School 43 will be returning to the city of Rochester, but School 20 will not be returning to the city of Rochester. That is correct. Okay. Anne Marie, what about swing space? Um, we are all set for swing space, and um, we've worked on all this, all of this with um, Mike Schmidt, um, and um, he for the actual North Star program. He and um, Keisha walked the building um, at School Twenty, and so they that would allow us to um, house 150 of our students. And so it would allow us to bring back and, and actually reduce a significant amount of money that we are um, sending to BOCES to support our students. Okay, well, since school 20 isn't returning. Uh, I'm sorry, can I just throw in there that um, this is the first time that mm. I'm hearing about the building being repurposed and utilized and there was plenty of opportunity before a city council meeting for this board to hear about that. That's all okay. I'm gonna say. All right, thanks, thanks Commissioner LeBron. Um, can I finish? Councilmember Patterson, go ahead. Thank you, and, and, and Commissioner LeBron, I hear you. Um, so school, tw school 20 is listed on page five as a closure for a savings of 3.5 million. So if you're not closing it, 
there must be some additional expense. So it is not a 3.5 million savings. Is that correct? The staff that were in school 20 will not be there. It's not going to be run as an elementary school. We're shifting the staff apparently from North Star going in there. So it's just moving those staff to service the students and the students returning from BOCES. So um, the actual program that was in 20 will no longer be in 20, much like 44 and 57. When you're swiping those staff out and just shifting another program in, the special ed programming that's going in will be following the students in from where they were. Okay, well in that case, I direct you to page seven of your document where you talk about transportation and facility savings. Mm -hmm. And the savings from closing and shuttering three buildings, 20, 25, um, and bell time, well, and bell time adjustments are 20, 25, and 43. So you were, you were looking at maintenance and utility savings of 350,000 for 20, 25, and 43, but apparently 20, which was originally to be closed and returned to the city, I thought, will no longer be closed and returned to the city, so you will be maintaining it. So there should be some manner of adjustment to the 350,000 you're showing as maintenance utility savings. Would that be correct? We will give you the exact breakdown of those. Those were actually run by Mike, and I'm assuming that they were part of that full 20 conversation. Um, but we will double back and get the exact amount so that it's clear. Uh, those are, I don't have that on my screen right now. Um, if we can go two pages in. Because those were lumped together, I guess it's another, the other way. Thank you. Um, if you'll see, they were not specifically broken out by building. So no, they won't. definitely give you those, um, and so you'll have more detail of what the maintenance and utility savings are. So is 25, your, your, your savings for 25, is that a bell time adjustment that you're making, which helps you re, re, reach that savings? Well, the bell time is across all of our buildings, middle or elementary and secondary. Uh, that was an overall shift in some bell times to make sure that they were consistent for the bus routes so that we could get more efficient in the way we deliver our students and pick up our students. So that's a whole other consideration um, separate, the 900000 Okay, well, then I direct you back to page seven. Um, the schools you have listed are 20, 25, and 43. Mm -hmm. Are you stuttering or closing school 25? Yes. School 25, that was the, um, we had the two breaks in steam pipes that virtually decimated the internal structure of that building. Um, and given the amount of as asbestos in that building, it was just too cost prohibitive to repair. So shifting our students out of school 25 uh, to a temporary location at our Dr. Freddie Thomas campus. Uh, so that school 25 will not be used by the district. Okay, well, other than page seven, where is that reflected in this document? You know, I apologize, it's not. And so we will make sure that we get you the clarification on that. It is part of the final decision in 25, um, to Bob's point, that happened very late in the process. We actually had three different breaks over a course of a week. Um, it occurred, I believe, two weeks ago, and a last minute decision was made on that. So we will get you those details. And there's, not a significant, I apologize. there's not a significant savings because the students are being shifted over to a different campus, but the, the uh, school staff have to shift with them. Okay, so, so you're closing it for a year to make repairs, or are you looking to return that to the city of Rochester? We are not making repairs. So you are looking to close School 25 and return it to the city of Rochester? Correct. So okay. it's, it's a little different. different. So it sounds like closing oh, the school. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mike still has the floor. I got it. it's, it's too many folks on the video thing for, for, for um, interruption. So Mike, when you're done, okay. um, then I got to go to Councilmember Lightfoot, then I go to Gruber, then I go to Lupian. But I, I got I to I keep it tight because otherwise we'll be all over the place. So sorry for being a... Uh, a little bit of a, a, a hard butt, but go go ahead, Mr. Pa uh, Mr. Patterson. So you were answering about School 25. Well, school 25, the the building is being shuttered and returned to the city of Rochester. There will exist a beds code for a school, 
uh, that school will uh, be run from uh, School 53, the, the Dr. Freddie Thomas campus, because there's an available wing um, that effectively allows us to run two schools out of that campus. Okay, so, so to recap, the buildings that are returning to the city of Rochester are schools 25 and schools 43. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and just a general question. Um, we have uh, laid off and furloughed some folks here at the city of Rochester. Um, it's an opportunity for us to save some dollars. Um, and it's also an opportunity for some of our staff who are, who are in that situation to make a few more dollars by taking advantage of the, uh, the programs that are currently out there related to COVID-19. Um, have you had a chance to talk with our staff at the city of Rochester to see whether or not that might be an opportunity that you should consider pursuing and what budget ramifications it would have? Would you like me to field that? Uh, I, I would field it and Bobby can jump in. Um, so furloughing for us is a, a little bit different conversation because we still have to meet mandated uh, school requirements, school year requirements, school day requirements. And so if we don't have staff working, they can't teach our kids. So it's not like we can do a wholesale. We have looked at and have made adjustments um, accordingly where we could reducing um, staff expectations, um, for instance, in extracurriculars, in substitutes, in other areas where we um, have not needed people, that those people are not being paid and will not be expected to work. But the wholesale say that our teaching staff and our support staff um, are, could be sent home and furloughed really is not an option for us if we have to meet our educational requirements as expected by the state. Okay, and my last question, you did answer, but I just wanna make sure that I did hear the answer that I heard. Page 13, you stated that you will no longer have negative numbers in your budget. Um, for the board, I guess this question is really directed more to the board than to anyone else. It has there, to the board, has there been a policy changed? Have you given your folks a direction that this is to no longer occur? President White? President White, is he online still? Yep. Councilman Evans, I think that question is better directed to Bob Franklin. Well, no, um, the question was for the pre board. President yep. White, and then, and then um, Commissioner Powell, I'm directing it to President White, and then if President White wants to turn over to uh, Mr. Franklin, he can. President White? Yes, uh, Vice President uh, Patterson, could you repeat the question? No, no, just council member. Okay. We got Vice President. Willie really Lightfoot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Could you repeat the question, Councilman Patterson? Yes, the question was regarding the practice of negative numbers in your budget. Um, earlier in the presentation, it was stated that that was no longer being carried out. My question for the board was, have you given them a policy directive or have you given them some instruction that that is to no longer occur? No, we have not, but I think it's a wise approach. I'll let Mr., I, I believe it was Bob who made the statement earlier on. Bob, why don't you elaborate on that, Mr. Franklin? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I actually stated that the fiscal year 21 budget will have a negative appropriation reflecting the savings associated with vacancy and staff turnover. I also described that um, I am aware that RCSD is somewhat unique in that approach to reflecting the savings, the savings from position vacancies, and we are more than willing to evaluate uh, changing our approach to that type of budgeting for the fiscal year 22 budget. All right, well, I don't know if I like, I, eh, I, I don't know if that answer is gonna work, but I will, I guess we'll have a conversation with the state auditors and see where we are with that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Council member, Thank I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Before I go to Council member Lightfoot, I just wanna, um, clarify something, and I know um, Council Member Lupian uh, sent, a note, sent me a note on this. Um, so School 25, just, just for clarification, the, the school itself is not closing. It is being shifted elsewhere, but the building is closing. Right. Okay. 
There's All right. Thank you. Um, um, Vice President Lightfoot. Uh, thank you, Chairman Evans, and greetings to each and every one of you. Peace and blessings to all of you. Uh, with respect to each and every one of you and your respective places. I have a very general question, just one question, uh, but very general, but I think it's germane to the overall budget. Uh, this year, the city of Rochester, uh, it's the first time we're instituting uh, racial equity tools within our budget uh, to help us look at our policy practices and procedures and how they uh, impact, especially people of color. And my question is, are you guys using any racial equity tool in this budget that you're uh, presenting to us? We've no, used no tool per se, but I'd love to hear more about the tool that you are using um, and whether we can adapt some of that. We do have um, obviously real interest and we have equity um, individuals focused on equity issues, but I'd love to know what the tool is, if we could figure out um, how it might be adaptable to us. So maybe you could share out with us, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice President. Um, Council Member Gruber. Thank you, and I'm, I'm deeply apologetic that everyone has to see my, my face on the screen. Next time I will uh, follow Commissioner Adams and wear a hat. I apologize for that. Uh, I have two uh, brief questions. Uh, the first is related to the, the pre-K. So I'm curious, um, initially when uh, the two pre-K, when the 400 some odd slots were supposed to be taken from CBOs and brought into the district, that was supposed to be budget, budget positive for RCSD. And then uh, over time, the argument and narrative kind of shifted around that. And now it seems as though um, you're talking about only closing one school and taking what I think I saw 215 slots. So can I understand what, what is the actual budget implication of taking these slots from the CBOs? Uh, so to go back to the original um, proposal that was approved by the board for two CBOs, um, I believe there was some confusion between closures of buildings and the cost of the program. Um, the operating of the pre-K itself was to be cost neutral. It was not to actually be savings. It was the building closures that generated the savings. Um, so um, it is still, it's not, there's still no cost by opening up one pre-K center. It's still that cost neutral. Um, and we still have the savings in closing buildings. Um, although one will be repurposed for staff, that's getting us out of another building um, to be able to relocate the staff there. But uh, we are going to, as part of uh, closing 44 as an elementary building, we'll still have the savings uh, from those buildings closures. The staff will not be needed anymore. Those students will be sent back to other um, elementary buildings in the district. Uh, just a related question of that. Have you, so now that the number of CBO slots has been shifted, um, have the CBOs been uh, notified yet? Do we know who the 215 are? They have been notified as of the end of last week, yes. Okay. Is that something that uh, the district would mind sharing with, uh, with council so we can have an understanding of that? Yes. Thanks. And, and, we, can my, put that, we, and we can put that in the question log, uh, Mr. Scanlon, the follow up. Thanks. And then my second question is kind of related to that. So by the, by the end of the whole um, uh, pre-K conversation, it ended with uh, former Superintendent Dade uh, basically making the argument that by um, taking these slots from CBOs and having them do it in the district, it will help to ultimately um, keep families in the district and increase enrollment over time. And I know that concurrently with all that, there seems to be a lot of um, shifting in the winds related to charter schools. I know that Urban Choice had lost their charter, but I, I think I saw in the papers that it actually, they actually got it back for a year. I've heard a couple other charters who I, I don't know if, uh, how public it is or if I'm just hearing whispers have, uh, have either lost or had their charters um, changed to a temporary status. I'm wondering, first of all, what I'm wondering largely, what is the district's ability with all of these cuts that you've sadly had to make? What is the district's ability to assume uh, students from the charter schools? Uh, that, that's a kind of macro question. And maybe the more micro version of it is, uh, would you have been able to uh, assume all the kids from Urban Choice if they hadn't had their charter renewed? And, and what would the plan have been? It's a great question. And um, we would have to look at the grade levels and the number of students and the capacity we have in 
each of our schools right now. When we um, did our budgeting for this year, in order to generate savings, we went to a staffing model that really pushed us very close to our contractual maximums. So we would have to take the numbers and rerun all the numbers, um, see where we have space in buildings uh, to be able to accept those students back. Without knowing the actual numbers, I don't think I could do that that quickly, but uh, we certainly would be willing to look at it. I did not hear that any charters ultimately had been closed or that they, were, they were, had their license revoked. I do know there was discussion at the last Board of Regents meeting, and I do believe ultimately there was approval. I haven't heard of any closures at this point, but if I don't have that current information, please, I'd love to hear more. Um, no, I, uh, Deputy Superintendent, I don't think I have any information that you don't have. I, I guess I'm mostly, I have, I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of organizations um, when COVID is in our rearview mirror, a lot of organizations that uh, are, are dependent upon private philanthropy and things like that are not going to look the same anymore. And I'm, I guess I'm just wondering if, let's say hypothetically, there's charters that do close um, in, in the next year, will the district be able to assume those students knowing that you are um, very much on the kind of, you're at almost capacity in terms of your staffing levels right now? Um, probably not if it was a substantial number of students, but we also wouldn't be paying out as much to charter schools and charter school tuition either. So um, I, we would have to probably adjust our staffing to take those in, but depending on the numbers of, of staff that we would need to accommodate the students, there would probably be a reduction of, again, the tuition going to charter schools to be able to do something. Okay. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm done, uh, Malik. I just wanted, to, just wanted to make sure that I have clarity. This budget that was approved um, that we're looking at does not assume the students from Urban Choice because that was. Am I wrong? That was that they they had their charter revoked and then it, they got it back. Is that right? Now they're still open. They're still going to be open. But when you were making the budget, was was it made with the idea that Urban Choice students would be enrolled in the district or or not? We did not assume that they would be enrolled in the district. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Council Member Ortiz, and then and then Council Member Lupian. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, since the changes uh, have been implemented um, as part of the new version of the budget, how different is the original figure of the 179 FTEs uh, that would have been created, or is that the new number? I think that's the previous number, if I'm not mistaken. Bob, do you have any well, I'm, the final if it's there. not the final number, it's pretty close to the final number. It wouldn't have changed by more than three or four positions. Okay, so it's still 179 um, new FTE positions in total. Uh, by titles, uh, yes, in that, that range, plus or minus. Okay, so then my next question on there is um, how many of the folks are going to be reassigned those that are those titles that are being cut. How many of those folks are being reassigned to these new 179 new position titles, if you will? Have you do you have that possibly available? We are still in the process of looking at open positions and considering posting of those positions, um, obviously advertising to those positions, interviewing, looking at qualifications. Um, bumping rights and rights to positions where it is required by either law or bargaining unit. So that process is still underway. We okay. also have to account retirements and resignations that are coming in, uh, which have, we are not done uh, with receiving those yet either. So those are all the factors that our, our human resources department is looking at right now. Okay. So as you work through that, when you actually have that final list, I'd be very curious to see how many of the folks transferred over to these new FTEs. Um, one of the other questions that I have, um, and I, I know that we probably want to get too far down into the details here, but at some point I would really like a better understanding. You said that seven of them were restored or uh, taken out. Uh, the instructional coach um, would love a better understanding of what exactly that is. You had 15, you took out seven, something like that, um, but what specifically that is. So that would be helpful. Um, another question that I have is, 
trying to have a better understanding of the schools that are quote unquote closing, but you're putting pre-K and offices in. Is it really cost effective to keep an entire building for pre-K and offices? Is the capacity the same that you're putting back into it? I, I'm just trying to understand. It would seem that it would not be cost effective to use it for just pre-K and offices like special ed. Um, but if you are going to terminate a lease in the process, it does help us save money. And so that is part of the shift is looking at what leases we're able to get out of um, and reallocating uh, space as well as also sharing space in buildings to maximize efficiency. So if you can put two programs in the same space um, and allow them to share staff, there's an efficiency there in the staff, st staff sharing that you don't get when they're not located in the same building. So all of those factors were part of looking at um, the shift of programs as well as the shift of staff in offices. Okay, if there's some way to easily illustrate that, that would be wonderful in terms of, so I, you, like you just talked about the program that was closing and moving to, I guess, 25 or whichever ones are going into those other buildings for pre-K specifically, um, because obviously the savings that are listed there would be, and I wrote that on the chat here, that would be diminished by repurposing. So I'm, sur I'm certain some of that is already in your calculation, but since there were some new things that were brought today, getting that illustrated for us would be very helpful. Um, and then my last question is the closure of the, the of RIA, of the Bilingual Academy, of a couple of the other programs. Um, how exactly are we going about, because um, you've said before, services will be provided to the students that are required, da, 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 right? Um, but how specifically are these students um, going to be uh, placed, if you will. What schools, what would that process look like for them to be able to select or be or be placed by the district? How I, I have yet to see exactly how that will happen. Um, so that's still an outstanding question for me. We can add that for any of that now. I, we can answer that. I mean, you, can answer any, yeah. you can answer any of those or you can provide those to us. Either way, those are all my questions. Yeah, Linda, if you wanted to give, I don't know if you had any answers to those now, but we definitely can get a more detailed answer um, as part of the log. But Linda, if you had any thoughts that you wanted to uh, Well, first, uh, I'll talk, I will talk RIA and BLLA. We will get the additional information on the shifts. I believe that was part of it. Um, and all the moving parts of the leases being terminated, the moving, moving of programs and combining of programs into one building. We'll provide a little map of that to probably help. Um, as far as RIA, RIA is not closing. RIA will be a 712 program. Uh, the K6 students will be transitioned into other buildings that already have available uh, programming to service their needs. And BLLA, the same thing. We, we already have bilingual programming available uh, to service our students, and we have looked at adjusting the staffing accordingly to be able to meet their needs. Uh, we are working with the state. They are very much involved in what we've been doing with regard to those students. We are in their collective action plan. Uh, with the transitioning students. So um, we have a team of staff that have worked at looking all of those students and where they will be located as part of this process, what the options are for those students. But more importantly, the state um, does have oversight over that process and um, are very actively involved with our programming for those kids. Thank you. Um, anything else, Councilor? Okay, uh, Council. Member Lupian. Good afternoon. Um, a few of my questions are more like Council Member Ortiz about process. Um, for class, so class sizes are going to be increased because of this, and I heard it was close to the contractual maximum. How does that work with COVID when we're trying to create more space in between students? Great question. Uh, we are actually working on our reopening plan right now, uh, waiting guidance from um, Mr. Duffy and his team Friday, as well as from the governor on what we should be considering as far as reopening, um, if that is this fall or whenever that might be. Uh, so a lot of questions to ask. Um, and if you're going from 18 to 19 students, it's not a huge difference in the approach um, or 20 to 21 students. Um, which is in some cases what these shifts were. It's not like we went from 10 to 20. It was a minor shift of two or three students per grade level. In some cases, that would be the most. So um, 
it really is not impacting the social distancing as much as what our overall plan would be for reopening and considerations that will have to go into that. Thank you. Um, will, can you talk a little bit about the transition plan for students that are moving from these schools and, and you know, a little bit kind of similar to um, Council Member Ortiz in, in terms of the programs, but it, more general, um, maybe not students who need services, but is there, um, you know, support for them making the decision to a new school? Will they automatically be assigned? Um, is there anything in terms of, you know, dealing with the loss of, you know, that culture of being part of a school family? We are working on that and have been since our original um, plan. We kind of had a little practice run with 44 and 57 when we originally planned to look at both of those buildings um, in February. So we have our placement offices working with students and families to look at their options, to counsel them and have these discussions. Uh, letters have gone out and to the families of the new buildings that have been added and we will go through the same process with each of those families so that they can understand their options and how we will be able to help their students transition with the supports necessary to be successful. So um, we absolutely are very mindful of that. That's good to hear, thank you. Um, in terms of the bell time changes, how will that be communicated to families um, of the affected schools? And that is also in the works. It'll be going out, I believe, later this week. We were working on the communications today now that the schedules are finalized. Um, we had to move a couple buildings around from early to late, uh, but I think we're, we're done now. So that communication will be going out this week uh, via the buildings uh, to communicate to their communities uh, so that there's an understanding. It'll obviously be posted on the website as well. Um, we've got a whole communication mechanism to robocall and mail to uh, parents with those changes are. That's really great. I know no, none of us really know what's happening in September, but it's good to make sure that they have that advance notice. So it's wonderful to hear. So my final question is more of a personal one since my kids go to 53, which is the other school at the Freddie Thomas campus. Will school four be moving or will it be a third school in that building? It is not moving, so it'll be another school in that building. Okay, um, how, how will that work? I don't know if I can answer all the details of that. Emily, are you still on to be able to answer that? Um, I do believe, um, and I, I'm trying to remember it was school four, one of the schools is moving back. They were using okay. Ray Thomas as swing space. They will be okay. moving back. So, so yeah. um, that's where the space will be for um, the school 25 students to move in. Yeah, because okay. school, school four is being renovated right now, right? That's yeah. Correct. That's correct. And it will be there. They were in swing space at Freddie Thomas. So it was breaking my brain to figure out how to fit a third school in there. But that's, yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm done. Thank you. Um, any other questions from um, council members? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. I'm sorry. Uh, is that the mayor? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Ahead, um, just mayor. a quick question about School 25 that I'm hearing that I want to know because it isn't in the documentation. So School 25 is returning to the city because there have been two leaks or some major damage that has been done to the school. So what condition is the building in and should it, and if it's in severe condition, who's gonna be responsible for the repairs? Um, and if it has to be demolished and other things like that, whose responsibility is that going to be? Because you can't defer maintenance and then have the city be responsible for demolition or repairing the building to get in a condition to sell? I think that's a conversation that we probably need to have between our operations and the department and the, and the city. Um, I can't, I can't hear you. If you can talk a little bit up, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that's a conversation we probably need to have between our operations and legal department and the city as well. Um, so that you can see what the nature was of um, the, the, the pipes that were leaking. Uh, we had three separate incidents we did repair but as we repaired, there was another leak that actually occurred. So um, it was over, over the course of a week, we did know about it and kept addressing it. But again, um, old infrastructure, uh, and it, we did struggle with trying to maintain um, those leaks. But we will have to have another conversation about what that looks like and get you into that building so you can see what we've been dealing with. But right now your plan is to return two buildings to the city this year? Correct. That's correct. And um, Mayor Warren, if I could just add, um, I know that um, Mike Schmidt and his team there 
actually currently still assessing the overall damages. They had just done a quick estimate, so they didn't have a full assessment um, completed, um, but they, they knew that the damage was so extensive that they would never have the building ready by the start of school. So that's why um, they were able to make the decision to shift the students to Freddie Thomas so that they would be in, in a secure location while they continued the assessment of School 25. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I'm, that'd be great for, I think, council just to get a follow-up too on um, the, the overall condition of 25 and what, what, what happens um, to that building from a, from a cost standpoint, what that, what that would cost for that repair. That's too bad that that's happened to 25. Any other um, questions? Mary Lupian, uh, Councilman Mary Lupian, of course, has one last question. It wouldn't be a committee meeting without one last question from Commissioner. From, but she's new, so we're giving her the benefit of the doubt. So um, we're keeping you a little bit longer, school district folks, so that you can blame Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Mary Lupian, go ahead. Um, how, how's it? Um... Has furloughing care professionals been looked at? You know, it would potentially be a pay boost for many of them, and you know, not sure what role they're playing right now. But just wondering if that had been considered. Um, well, most of our care professionals are in the special education department and are actually servicing um, our students with IEPs. And if it is required that they have a care professional reporting the IEP, then we cannot uh, furlough them. They have to continue to provide those supports. So it's not as large a number as you might think at the end of the day. So. Those staff have to be maintained throughout this closure to um, provide those services. But Thank you. Point, we, we continue to scrub staff. Like I said, we've looked at subs, we've looked at other staff that are doing, that would have been assigned to do things above and beyond uh, that aren't needed. And um, we have been doing that um, since the beginning of the closure and continue to do so even today. Thank you. I have no further questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, <laughs> um, just one last technical question I have is um, the budget arrival to council, the, the, the full budget, when is that arriving? Is that arriving this week? Um, I'm, I'm sure council members are anxious to stay up late and start reading it along with the mayor's budget. So we, we got, we'll, we'll be busy looking at stuff over the next month. Is that, what, what date is that coming? Yeah, uh, we'll get that tomorrow. Budget books have been okay. printed today. They are being picked up and will be delivered uh, to your offices, city hall tomorrow. Thank you. And if there's not any other... Um, council Member Evans, sorry. Yes. Uh, staff will work with the uh, council to see how they'd like the budget to be delivered. We can deliver both the school district and the city budget likely together. Uh, and I believe Barb Campbell in our office is calling through to find out if people want them dropped at their homes or left uh, in their offices at, at City Hall. So we will coordinate budget distribution on the council end. Okay, as long perfect. as, and I'll, I'll be in touch with RCSD staff to make sure that we get the initial budgets. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there's not anything else, I mean, I would just um, ask that we uh, be prayerful, hopeful that our federal government will um, come through with aids to states and municipalities. I think that that will help all of us that are um, on this line. That is critical. Um, I know that um, on the city side, the mayor and her team are probably pulling their hair out with um, the what ifs that could happen if, if that's not delivered. And um, I think that this is one area where we definitely all can agree on. Um, I'm sure you guys are feeling the same way on your side that we really need to push our folks in Washington um, to do the right thing because we're talking about uh, real people, real lives, um, and real things that will have a major impact if we don't get um, some type of funding and relief from the federal government for something that none of us are responsible for, which is the coronavirus. So um, I want to thank you all for taking the time um, for attending this meeting. I hope that it was, it was helpful and it will allow us to um, continue to have a smoother uh, budget process when we meet um, in June to talk about the district's budget. So if there is not any other uh, business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. You too.